Scream 6 or Scream VI review and thoughts. Now, the. Let's see. Yes, so I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes and I will get into some serious topics. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for the first five movies. And as, I, as soon as I end the review itself, please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for all six movies. And there will be a link to a playlist on my videos on all of the, yeah, all of the movies in the series in the description box. And yes, I will be discussing the ending when I get into thoughts. So, including the identity of Ghostface. So, this movie is rated R including for language and yeah I I might swear in this video it's well it's a well-earned R uh, this it's it's pretty violent and and bloody and gory so the um, yeah so just real quick you know, I think every single Friday the 13th movie is watchable, enjoyable. I wouldn't say that any of them are, like, particularly good. You know, Halloween 1978 is legitimately an excellent movie. And so is the... Basically, every Nightmare on Elm Street movie other than the, the sixth and the remake... And, you know, depending on when you ask me, my personal preference either lies with the two Wes Craven ones or 2, 3, and 4. I love Candyman 1992 and 2021. Uh, let's see. The Child's Play movies are fine. Uh, I, I haven't watched past Seed of Chucky. I hear that some of the... Are they movies now or are they shows? I, I forget, but... I've heard that reason child child's play is really good, and I think that is about what. But but yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of the slasher subgenre. I've been for as long as I've been able to watch these movies. So let's see, since the late nineties. And I watched this movie once, and I started recording this video just right, like right after getting home from the theater. So it is very fresh in my mind. And let's see. So yeah, the the plot is basically that you know we are now in New York, and the survivors of the, you know, yeah, the survivors of Scream 5 are, are trying to, you know, leave Woodsboro behind, s start a fresh chapter in New York City. And that, let's see, the, um, that, brings us to the writing. So, in preparation for this, I rewatched every Scream other than 3. I was not able to get a copy of 3 in any format other than VHS and my VCR. Uh, yeah, so... Now, this was written by James Vanderbilt and Guy Busick who also wrote Scream 5 together, and let's see, did they both write for Ready or Not? James Vanderbilt didn't, but Guy Busick also helped write Ready or Not, which is excellent. And 
yeah, they they do a really good job. They they come up with some some really great what's the word like um, scenarios, which is super important in a slasher. If you want to stand out, you gotta have some some settings and setups for the the slashing, you know. And yeah, there's some super memorable yeah in in this. And let's see. So yeah, I would say it handles plot twists well. I have seen some that didn't, you know, so, some people feel that the movie basically falls apart near the end. I disagree, but, you know, to, to each their own. Now, I don't think there are too many twists, and I don't think they're too bad. It is definitely a case where, like... There's there's a bunch there's a there's a lot of stuff you're not gonna see coming and that brings us to the direction so this was directed by the radio silence duo Tyler Gillett and Matt Bellini Alpin who together also directed Scream Five Ready or Not two segments of Southbound Devils Do and one segment of VHS. Now, the... Oh. Uh, actually, right. Tyler Gill... Both of them directed this Ready or Not and, and Scream 5, but the Matt Bellini Open is not credited as working on the... Anyway the the um, segments and and devils do i have not watched the the um, you know vhs southbound or devils do but i do think they did fantastic on the yeah both of the screen movies they've now done and ready or not uh, big big fan of of them now let's see so the um yeah um I have a ranking, worst to best, all of the Scream movies other than this one, 3, 2, 4, 1, and 5. Hopefully that will help you determine if you're particularly going to, you know, agree with what I'm about to say. So, let's, yeah. Right, so there's some there's some IMDb trivia. Yeah, the film was greenlit three weeks after the release of Scream Five, and yeah, I I was a little bit I don't no no I wasn't even really worried. I figured the fact that they agreed to make it instead of asking it to be postponed meant that they had good stuff and I yeah I think I I would be very happy to, to you know I if they actually make like one per year of these or something you know as long as they have ideas I'm I'm completely down for that and and I would definitely say I, I could see how they could follow this one up so yeah and let's see See. Yeah, it was shot in Montreal, made to look like New York, and let's see, yeah, so the, the, this was the, the, yeah, several of the, the people working on it said leading up to its release, Right, I should also briefly say, I think, I literally did watch this as soon as it came to a theater near me. I realized that apparently everybody else got this, like, two or three weeks ago, but, you know, yeah. Let's see, but but yeah, th this was, uh, this this is more bloody and violent than the Scream movies before it. And 
and let's see. Um, right. So yeah, uh, Jenna Ortega said, really, you know, so excited about. There's a lot of good chase sequences, and yeah, absolutely true. It's a really, really incredible, uh, yeah. And let's see. Yeah, and and Melissa Barrera um, talk about you know setting the setting the movie in New York City makes it all more horrifying. It's like 20 times more mortifying. It's awful because you see how in a city like New York City, everyone is kind of doing their own thing and someone is screaming for help and no one will come to their help. No one comes to help them, you know, like everyone's kind of like, I'm not getting into that, so it's mortifying because you're chased by a ghost face, but you also see humanity and how that reacts in a situation like that. Let's see... And Kevin Williamson said, it doesn't feel like part six. It feels like you're watching this big, huge, fresh reinvention. I love it. I've watched the movie with a big smile on my face. I think it's everything and more. And going to New York was awesome. The movie feels new, feels fresh. It feels like a new movie. And this actually, yeah, this is only the second movie in the series to leave the small town more than briefly. The third movie was largely set in Hollywood, which is still in California, so the same state as 1, 2, 4, and 5. Now, uh, let's see. Yeah, and and here, you know, the, the, you know, California and New York, West Coast, East Coast kind of thing. So it's not just like you know, five-minute bike ride away from... Uh, now, uh, New York did not work out super well for Jason Voorhees. Uh, th this is substantially better. This is a, a much, much better movie than Jason Takes Manhattan. And... Let's see... Yeah, you know, lots of location changes don't work out well for slasher sequels. I, I'm very, very impressed with how well they did here. It really did not feel like, you know, the, the, one of the big things when you take a series that usually, again, like, we've never, this is the first movie where we leave the state and the, the you know, it's only the second where we even leave the town. Or, or is it a city? Whatever, you know, the, so... Yeah, there's a there's a risk that it can feel alienating, that it can feel like, oh, it's just a completely different thing. And that doesn't happen. Like it does not feel like it's just completely lost its identity. It it is carving out pun intended, a new identity. It's it's not you know yeah, Scream Five was the one where it's like don't worry, we're super big fans of these movies. We love them as much as you do. Now, please, pretty please, let us do our thing, and we will show you that we have something to bring. This is that thing, and yeah, I. This is this is yes, I I am I am really really happy that these guys got it. Can can is it is it completely impossible to get like. I honestly, I, 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 I want them to keep working on Scream as long as they do, but I, I feel like, like, okay, so now we have Halloween, now also Scream, can, can somebody, like, convince, is it still with Platinum Dunes? Because if they just, if they sell Nightmare on Elm Street and or Friday the 13th, I think they could make that really, really good. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for a really, really compelling Nightmare on Elm Street movie today. Uh, you know, so, so, yeah. Anyway.
but but yeah, you know, there are tons of places in New York that can be made creepy, and this does a really great job. And let's see. So so yeah, like Ready or Not, you know, the this is both really tense and really hilarious. You know, like Jordan Peele, these directors understand today it is necessary to subvert some of the horror tropes because otherwise we know what's coming. However, others have to be played straight, otherwise it becomes a parody, which is not necessarily bad, but not the desired outcome. And because some are subverted while others are played straight, the viewer never knows which to expect. The laughs release the tension built without having to resolve the source of tension. And, yeah. Ready or not, and both of their screen movies do this, and just yeah, I'm I'm really really. You know what? I maybe I will have to watch. Like, let me know in the comments. Do you think the Devils Do is worth watching? Cause it is on. It is on Disney Plus. So I am. I I could hypothetically at least if I try to watch it really really soon. It's just, it's gotten really, really negative reviews, you know, that's really the only reason I haven't watched it, because, holy crap, they're talented. Now, each of the previous screen movies has, has technology either be a threat or be in some way related to the threat, and that is still the case. And, let's see, yeah, and, and the other, you know, all of the screen movies play with your expectations of who's victim, who's killer, who will survive, they're some of the only movies to have anyone other than the final girl survive being attacked by the killer. And let's see. Yeah, the 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 various yeah, the, the screen movies tend to have there's a degree of cynicism, especially in the younger characters. And Scream 2 is basically the only sequel that isn't doing the first movie again, but in a different way movies three four and five do now the three nor four got another movie in the series for over a decade so it wasn't what you might call well received and yeah this one really does go for being a sequel it's not redoing the first movie and let's see so so yeah um this again has some excellent ghost face calls like the fifth and the first, and honestly, I really wish it was more of, like, I, there's, there's a lot of stuff in the screen movies that I could get in other slashers, but the phone calls is one of the only things that just, like, there are not enough slasher, yeah, sl slasher movies, slasher franchises, where, the killer will verbally taunt and toy with the the person you know there's there's yeah there's there's ghostface there's freddy krueger so i i it's it's one of my biggest issues with the other sequels there's just way too little of of that and they do a really great job of that here now let's see. So the, the right, the fifth movie comments on horror movie fandom, where the previous movies comments and more on the relationship between horror movies and other media, such as American news media coverage of real life violence, the way they talk about fictional violence. Um, yeah, this movie does some of both, and I might get some into details in the second. Spoiler section. Now, one of, the, one of the things that makes these movies so scary is the sort of distant, distant intimacy of a phone call. You can hear the person as if you're standing close to them, but you can't see them. So the person on the phone, you know, if they're threatening you, you don't know where they would attack you from, unlike if they were there in person and not on the phone. And... Yes, yeah, so the first four movies really comment on American media coverage of violent events. Um, I'm not sure I would say that this necessarily does that more than the fifth. 
and all of the movies use technology, especially media and communication, as part of the horror. And yeah, like movies four and five, this is more visceral in the violence than the first three. And let's see. So so yeah, I already mentioned you know the the um, Scream Five is basically proof of concept, like Halloween twenty eighteen and. The Force Awakens. Don't worry, we love the original. Now, please trust our vision in the future. And yeah, I love The Last Jedi. I love aspects of Halloween Kills and Ends. They took big chances that a lot of people hate, which is something that Scream 5 satirizes. And I, I suppose. I think overall, like, this does not take chances the way that The Last Jedi, Halloween Kills, Halloween Ends do. But I, I don't think that it needed to take more chances than it does. Now, uh, right, yeah, and the other movies do great juxtaposing of fake media violence with in-universe real violence, and this does as well. And yeah, this and Scream 5 have more emotional intelligence and maturity than the first four. And, you know, so I, I rewatched Scream 4, and it's like, it calls itself a remake, but it isn't quite a remake. It's it is techn it is a soft reboot. I think it might be the first soft reboot in in film. I I don't offhand know of another soft reboot that cuz and it is like at the time they were making remakes, you know, in, in horror so anyway. Now, let's see. Yes, so I have some critic quotes. Um, okay, so this person says that the, yeah, they missed there being an investigation. It's just, it's one chase after the other. Uh, let's see, and... Right, I wanted to briefly note, I'm not going, going to give away who Ghostface is, and if there's more than one. What I will say is, I did not guess the identity of Ghostface, and the, the, the one or more actors playing Ghostface do a great job both once we know their ghost face and they get to just ham it up and be crazy and ridiculous it's, you know and in in other scenes where they have to play normal people you know prior to that now uh, right so yeah one this one critic said Dialogue scenes are shot in the most basic, flat manner possible. The directors have characters usually sitting or standing still while delivering exposition. Rarely do they ever do anything. It's reminiscent of the Star Wars prequels, where characters just stand there while talking endlessly. A good director will give his actors something to do during these scenes. Have them walk from A to B, carry some item, pack a suitcase, water a plant, eat an ice cream like doing the original, anything to break up the monotony, not so here, they just stand around waiting for the next chase or kill scene. Yeah, I suppose that's uh, true. Now, let's see... Um, yeah, some people didn't think the, the meta-narrative stuff was that good. And... let's see... And right, so this person says because the movie is done on a lower budget, it didn't take full advantage of the setting of New York. 
and yeah, this person thinks that if Jason takes in Manhattan did do a better job. I completely disagree, and I I don't hate that movie. I I don't really. There's no there's no. Um, I don't hate any of the Friday movies. I, you know, I pretty much any time I could sit down and watch pretty much any of them. But it's to, yeah, to each their own. And let's see. Yeah, the fact that you know the the characters are now in college resembles Scream 2 and Yeah, uh, one, one critic says it's an echo chamber of nostalgia that doesn't push itself forward. There is some some truth to that. And Okay, one yeah, one critic says the the movie features no real progress or even movement. It's like treading water in gore. I I I don't really see I I don't know what they were expecting that they didn't get here. Now let's Mm, I think that might be the ones. That... Yeah, the, the one critic points out the inventive postmodern thrill of the original film and its solid first sequel is now itself a tired trope. And let's see. It's not easy to take a well-established franchise and make it one's own. Radio Silence has achieved that. And... I think that... Scream 6 lets its freak, fra freak flag fly and relishes in gory, gruesome, and gloriously entertaining mayhem. This series does away with that formula, but without replacing it in any meaningful way. Let's see. The Die Hard with the Vengeance of the Scream series. We go to a different place, get a new kind of danger. In California, you can jump out of the window to get away from Ghostface. In New York, the buildings are much too tall. Uh, let's see. The subway explores the threat of random strangers on public transportation. The Ghostface actor is clearly enjoying himself. This is the most vicious and public Ghostface we've seen. Not scared of being discovered. Some of the gore gets close to sadistic, which makes this critic feel uncomfortable. And let's see. The characters ensure the emotional engagement, which I, I, yeah, I'm really, really impressed with how well, really all of the, yeah, every, every, um, screen movie, even, like, for sure, there are weaknesses to the third, but even that one, like, the characters are legitimately memorable and interesting. You know, for, for sure, there are some characters in the third movie that are like, okay, that's, that person is really annoying, but they're not boring. And, let's 
yeah, the movie explores whether or not Sam might eventually become a killer. The major characters support each other and work together. That's why Gen Z can relate to them. Kirby and Mindy sit down and discuss horror together, and it's great. And let's see the... Yeah, one critic says, The Big Apple has just enough bite to make Scream 6 worthwhile, but in an era when ele elevated horror is winning Oscars, this rule breaker from the past can't seem to be anything other than a retro diversion. And it is true that the series started out as being fresh and, you know, yeah. I don't I, I wouldn't really say that it does something here that makes it fresh like there's enough here that it doesn't just feel like oh you know whatever another scream sequel you know if, if you don't if you're if you're invested in scream you might want to watch this one you know Check multiple reviews, check, uh, you know, but certainly if you don't really care about the Scream series and you don't, if you're not a fan of slasher movies, this one really doesn't do anything. Like, I would argue that when the first Scream came out, even if you didn't really care about slasher movies, you could still really get into that movie because there's, you know, it's not just a slasher movie you know if you've watched that one and you want something that's just like completely different and new I'm not sure this really is the the one to to do that now the, which is too bad you know the the ready or not didn't just feel like it was something that had already been done, although I acknowledge that there are elements of it that had been done before. But that was also, that was completely their baby. That was the radio silence. You know, they, they came up with that out of whole cloth. Here, they were brought on to work on someone else's, you know, so, yeah. I, you know, they they do have one of the one of my favorite things about Ready or Not is that that movie has things to say, and so does this and Scream Five. So it's not, you know, like it's not this kind of mercenary director thing where they just hand it to someone who has made money in the past. They they do clearly care about the you know but yeah it's not quite as good as ready or not it is in in that regard i mean now i'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending but the ending fits with what came before i i really really like the ending of the movie now let's see uh, right, so I have some critic quotes about the the ending of the movie. One, uh, yeah, one critic says, or one one review says, the worst thing about the movie is the last twenty minutes. Might be the worst last twenty minutes of any Scream movie, close to the hospital ending of Scream Four. Scream Four has an excellent ending, so yeah, I don't really know. If, like, just anyway. Uh, let's see. The final act of this film will likely please every fan of this franchise. It's very well crafted and full of the best kind of nostalgia. Very true. And... Let's see. Um... Yeah, I think I will comment on the... I'm just going to make sure to put that in the... There we go. Okay, so... This is the the first of these to have a post credit scene. And 
like if you're if you're exhausted by the end of the movie, you know, you don't need to see it. It's not going to like ruin everything if you don't see it. But if you're like game for for a little bit more Scream 6, you know, I I'm very happy that I stayed through the the end credits to watch the the post credits scene. So, the characters. So yeah, the the, the all Scream movies have feisty women and some really goofy and ridiculous dudes. Uh, you know, especially the killers, but also Dewey, Randy, and yeah, you know, Chad continues to be kind of ridiculous and yeah, I really appreciate, like, you know, I, I like the character in Scream 5 as well. There were some things... Yeah, I'll keep it vague. There, there are things in this that he gets to get into that didn't in, in Scream 5, and I was very, very happy to, to see that. And... Yeah, the movie has some compelling stuff from major characters, character arcs and such. And let's see. This one does not really have a Dewey equivalent. You know, in, in Scream 4, in addition to Dewey, we have the young female deputy. This is the first movie to not have Dewey in it at all. He was more John Wake than Dewey in Scream 5, though. And uh, did Scream 5 have a normal Dewey equivalent? I, I guess not, no. Yeah, I, I think an argument could be made that maybe the Radio Silence duo are not that interested in the the regular Dewey, you know, and... I think that's fine. I I think they can survive. And and there are, you know, there there are like detective types. I'm talking about the the goofy kind of stuff, Dewey. Uh, you know, where he'll yell at you know, he'll confront Gale and he has memorized you know, parts of the book she wrote criticizing him. Uh, you know, he he calls her phone head because her phone goes off after she calls him bonehead that kind of thing doesn't really happen in in this one so courtney cox as gail weathers you know she yeah she's she's the only legacy survivor from the the first 3 to to still be uh, you know around and and featured in the film and yeah, you know, she's one of the most fun characters in the earlier films. And yeah, there's still like, I was wondering, you know, will this retain the sometimes goofy sense of humor of the four Wes films, three of which were written by Kevin Williamson? So, you know, Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson, you know, yeah, they. To, you know, together gave those movies that kind of goofy sense of humor, and yeah, she is definitely the the you know yeah she's she's very op opportunistic, and let's see, right, um, yeah, the the you know. I, I'm not sure there's really a foil for her in the fifth movie, but I think an argument could be made that there is here. And, yeah, you know, like, in the in the first, there's some with, you know, Sydney. In the second, it's Debbie Salt. The third movie was Angelina Tyler. The fourth, it's Judy Hicks. So... According to IMDb Trivia, Neff Campbell stated on June 6th of last year that she would not be reprising her role of Sidney Prescott due to a salary dispute with Paramount. 
and uh, yeah, I'm quoting directly from uh, Campbell's statement. As a woman, I've had to work extremely hard in my career to establish my value, especially when it comes to Scream. I felt the offer that was presented to me did not equate to the value I have brought to the franchise. It's been a very difficult decision to move on. To all my Scream fans, I love you. You've always been so incredibly supportive to me. I am forever grateful to you and to what this franchise has given me over the past 25 years. And, uh, yeah, um... Her former Scream co-star, Matthew Lillard, Lillard, offered his support for her decision. Did Tom Cruise take less money for Maverick 5? I really, really, really like Matthew Lillard. Especially when in, when when it's related to Scream. I'm not going to claim that everything he did. That, every, you know... Yeah. But he's he's just... Yeah. Let's see, and yeah, he you know he asked, insisting that a woman should not be expected to take a smaller paycheck. He noted the smash that Scream Five was a smash hit, and that Campbell should be paid accordingly. Absolutely agreed. The other movies, especially one, two, and four, would not be what they were without her. And yeah, you know it's it's too bad that she's not in this, but I agree with her decision and. Like for sure, you know, the 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 um other members of the cast and various reviewers have pointed out the fact that Sydney isn't in this one, like, it would actually, it would be very weird if she were. Like, the, the, the other movies, they always manage to come up with some explanation. And, you know, it, it helps that she's usually in the same state. You know, it's, it's, she's not usually, like, incredibly far away, but in this one, you know, if if I understand correctly from this movie, from what what they say in this movie, according to the movie, Sydney is still in California, and like the idea that she would just she would travel from California to New York, like there's you know you would really need a huge like thing for for and and you know yeah basically one of the characters in this movie says she deserves her happy ending and that's the that's the right way to handle it you know she does and yeah like if i watched the movie and i didn't know it was a salary dispute like i i it didn't feel bitter it didn't feel petty or or any like it it really was the the yeah, it just it I I I don't even know how they would have fit like this movie did not feel like it would there there's not a Sydney Prescott sized shaped hole in this movie. It really it works exactly as it should. You know, and this was also like so many of these movies have kind of felt like basically Scream 4, 5, and 6 are trying to move not necessarily away from Sidney Prescott, but at least not have her be the you know the the only focus or the main character anymore. And I really feel like they they really nailed it here, you know. Yeah, with 5 Part of it, like, if they had made five and Sidney Prescott wasn't in it, a lot of people would have hated the movie just for that. But now that they've proven, no, 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 we can do, we can do a Sidney Prescott story. We can do a story where she's really, really important. Uh, you know, she, and, and, yeah, I'm really glad in how they, they handle it. Let's see, and... Yeah, um, you know, like, ready or not, 
Scream 4 and Scream 5 is very bloody and gory, which the first three Scream movies, you know, to, to an extent that the first three Scream movies were not. And, yeah, in all of them, the violence is very convincing FX-wise. Now, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, so the... Um, some critics have said the kills are personal and character driven. You spend more time with the sisters together. You see the different aspects of siblings living together. And let's see. Yeah, and and Gillette said we love Neve. We're huge fans. Nev, we were huge fans of Sidney Prescott, but it felt like there's an opportunity to really dig into this new crop of characters, and I think people will be really surprised and pleased with how successfully this movie does that. This movie's been in our lives for quite a while now, but I think we are still consistently surprised by how rich and how interesting and deep the character, the relationship is between the four of them in this movie. And, yeah, so, some more critic quotes. So much bigger, best chases of the series, absolutely. Extremely tense, suspenseful, much darker. Takes risks, never seen this ghost face before. Sam is interesting, Jenna Ortega steals the show. Samara, Samara Weaving was great, great legacy characters. And without Sydney or Dewey, we see a new side of Gale. And, let's see... It's great that there's so little of the legacy characters. Sam fighting Billy's influence is great. Tara claps back excellently. All cast are given material that plays to their strengths. Kirby adds to plot. Love her scenes with Gale. Ghostface is filmed in a really scary way. Subway and convenience store scenes blew my mind. There's a lot to them that we didn't see in the trailers. The third act is big, but also personal. Uh, the movie comments on how internet reacts to news stories. And... Kept me guessing. Cold Open was different. Kirby is still Kirby, but has a career complicated background. Doesn't feel like New York, but college, like Scream 2, to limited scope. Hard to believe, such as Ghostface escaping crowded places. Most brutal kills, we see the knife go in, it goes on for longer, what the knife does. Social commentary not as good, but the film is good without it. The sequels before this one are all sequels to the original. This is the first sequel film to move the franchise forward. Sam is nutty, a fun protagonist, and it leans into this interesting aspect. And let's see. Um, one person says half an hour could easily be trimmed out. Doesn't use its running time as well as some of the others. <sighs> I don't know. I I I don't really see that anyway. Right. And and yeah, this one person says that some of the characters are really obnoxious. I don't you know, that's there's definitely an issue in the slasher subgenre of obnoxious characters. But I've never found that to be a problem with the screen movies, and yeah, I still don't. Let's see. Right, uh, I did see at least one user review claim that the the people in this are cast because they're not white. I, if you really don't think that the cast here are immensely talented, I don't even know how to talk to you. Like, that's, yeah, 
They're they're incredibly talented. And I I cared about every major character. Now let's see. Uh, in all the other Scream movies, you kind of know who will die, who will survive. No one felt safe in this one. Even though it was the longest of the series, it did not feel like that. Honestly, could have gone for longer. Yeah, seriously. Pretty much none of the characters in this movie are the same as when we last saw them. Each of the core four who survived the last movie has changed in some way, whether in a healthy way or not. Especially shown with the Carpenter sisters. The two sisters have very different ways of coping with the tragedy that happened to them. Both actresses do a spectacular job of showing it. Tara just wants to keep living her life, focus on the future she wants instead of the past. She doesn't want this tragedy to define who she is. Instead, shows that she's more than just this tragic event that happened to her. And Sam is like a parental figure to her. Um, and yeah we see her deal with the issues of her father instead of just pushing them to the side these really are like she is one of the most interesting like slasher protagonists and them. Yeah, um, Sam, you know, the, 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 yeah, the survivors of Scream 5 want to put the, the past behind them, but Sam is, you know, having some problems with that, partly because an internet-driven conspiracy theory is running rampant, claiming she was the real killer. And, yeah, you know, that that is, like, you know, it's it's similar to, like, how Alex Jones has gotten people to attack the parents of kids who died during school shootings. You know, there's also, like, how, like, I'm not going to claim that Dr. Fauci did, like, everything 100% perfectly, but he was trying. He he actually wanted to save people's lives, and now he's being vilified by Republicans. Just completely absurd, you know. So yeah, this is an extremely relevant, uh, you know. Yeah, some something extremely relevant to comment on. Let's see. And, like the other screen movies, it comments on the relationship between real-life violence and media that in some way deals with it. Women in this franchise are not wilting flowers waiting for someone to rescue them, especially Courtney Cox, Hayden Pettigrew, Jenna, Jenna Ortega, and Melissa Barrera are giving Ghostface a run for his money, and then some. And... So, so yeah, uh, I don't have much more to add about Melissa Barrera, but just, yeah, incredible job. Um, let's see, I think, I think it was Film Brain who said, he, he didn't think that Barrera was that great in Scream 5, but he did think he that she did well here in, in Scream 6, and I do think she's better, but I did like her work in, in 5. And Jenna Ortega plays Tara Carpenter. And let's see, so, some people say that she's basically just collecting her paycheck. She probably signed on for the sequel before she signed on for Wednesday. Like, I really did not feel like she was sleepwalking through this. It With both this and Scream 5, it really felt like she wanted to be there. And... Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I can't help but wonder if that person was maybe projecting and they were thinking, wow, she's... Uh, I, you know, I haven't watched Wednesday. I don't have Netflix. I've heard it's great, so I'm not criticizing that. But, yeah, I, I really didn't get that. And, and I, 100%, I believe, I'm, I'm certain that 
the, um, Jenna Ortega gets more like she can she can really go buck wild in that you know the the um, that's a that's something that allows I guess it's a series that series allows for her to just go buck wild and here she does have you know there are some fairly strict parameters for what her character can so and and you know I I, I feel like I've heard that she said in an interview that Wednesday was basically her dream job so you know for for sure that's and and that's really cool I I'm I think she does really great I I, I guess I haven't seen her in anything other than these two but I'd like to she she's really really talented Hayden Panettiere returns as Kirby Reed and yeah you know like in Scream 4 you know she's it's very Confident, masculine, straight cis woman, loves horror movies, refuses to be shamed for who she's attracted to, making it clear to the audience there's nothing wrong with that identity. And she's now FBI, similar to how Dewey started out deputy and became sheriff in, you know, by, by Scream 4, he was sheriff of uh, Woodsboro. So, yeah, it's... That's a, a clever, and, and she has that of authority to her, uh, you know, and yeah, really, really great. Also, big, I'm, I've am i always really loved Hayden Panettiere, so I'm really glad to see her again. I, I'm aware she has done other stuff recently, but I, I don't watch everything of, of hers. And Jasmine Savoy Brown plays Mindy Meeks Martin. Randy's niece, Chad's twin, and yeah, she really brings the Randy energy. Like, she is, there's this thing where she, she is 100%, she, she needs to figure out who the killer is, you know, and, and just, you know, she'll be like, ah, oh, did, could could this person be the killer? Could this person be the killer? You know, and she's just like people are dying, and and like everybody else is like, how how do we keep safe? How does you know we gotta we gotta can we can we set up you know how how do we how do we best fight Ghostface? M meanwhile, Mindy is like ah oh, I I know I can I I can do this I can do this. Who is the killer? Let me think. You know, it's just, it's, yeah. If I haven't said it before, then I should have. Every Scream movie really needs, if not a straight Randy, the Randy energy, at the very least. you got to have that in there. It's just, it's, it's key to making it Scream, and just... Yeah, she she is really really great. Is uh, just yeah, and Mason Gooding plays Chad Meeks Martin, Randy's nephew, Mindy's twin, and yeah, he's he's really great again. Like he's he's this kind of jock, you know, and he's like he's not just the the you know. There's more to him than that, but he does have that. Like he's. He's maybe a little overprotective and overeager sometimes, and yeah, they have some fun with that. And this features Henry Cherney and Samara Weaving, who were both also in Ready or Not by the, the same director duo. And yeah, really, really great to see Samara Weaving. I... I I gotta f somehow find more stuff to to watch her in because holy crap she's good and she she does not have a huge amount of screen time in in this one. Um, honestly, I feel like she if if they were you know if they were starting from scratch, I feel like she probably would have been of a major uh, you know. Yeah, ma major part of one of these movies, but I'm really glad you know they they get some really great work out of her again, and just like 
I I actually rewatched Ready or Not just a couple of days ago, so I was a little wondering, oh, is it is this gonna feel like just the same character? Like they just you know picked her from one of their movies and plopped her into and no, not at all. Like you know, I recognized her. Uh, you know, she has a very distinctive face, but it didn't feel like the same character at all. Like she has a completely different vibe, and yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, when discussing Ready or Not, a number of reviewers, independently of each other, have declared Samara Weaving the best new Scream Queen. I agree, and yeah, I... <laughs> it's probably not very practical, but nevertheless, I would like to... Pitch, I I think Samara Weaving should appear at least briefly in every single horror movie that in any way gets like any scares at all from a woman screaming because holy fuck her scream just like. amazing like she she really and there was actually there was a fairly recent like she was on one of those late night shows and you know one of the masks so i hear you have a great screen and you know she's like are you sure i mean i, I can do it but i just want to make sure you're ready you know and she does the scream and the the interviewer like jumps out of the seat and it's just because it really is like she has just an absolutely amazing scream and yeah, uh, I, I gotta try to find the other horror movies that she does that she just, yeah, she's she's amazing. And I'm really, really glad. It, it, again, that's another thing, like, sometimes, you know, you watch a JJ thing, and it's like, so, JJ really wanted to work with this person again, evidently, and it's not, you know, they're they're talented. Like I I don't know that J.J. Abrams hires people who are not super talented, but like occasionally you'll be watching a J.J. Abrams thing, and it just feels like okay, this there's not really a reason for this role to be played by this particular actor. This is just J.J. kind of wanted to work with this actor again, so they brought him, you know he brought that particular actor back. This was not that at all. Both Henry Cherney and Samara Weaving really feel like they belong in this movie. Tony Revolori is also amazing. Like, I swear, every single thing I see him in, he's playing a role that's completely different from the rest of them, and he's so convincing in each of them. I'm really, really impressed. That's again, like, if you've been following, like, you're not at all surprised by that. You know, he's, yeah, everybody knows he's incredibly talented. But just, yeah, um, yet again, like, he, what he plays in this, I would not have guessed. Uh, you know, based on the, the Spider-Man trilogy and the Willow streaming show, you know, just... He keeps surprising me, and I am never unhappy. I am always happy to see him in something. And let's see, I don't know if I want to mention that, but yeah, Josh Segara is in this, and he's really great. And Roger Jackson, Roger L. Jackson, yet again plays the the um. The, the voice of Ghostface. Right, and, and yeah, Jack Champion is also really great. And... Right, and Dermot Mulroon. Like, this, it just amazing cast. Like, really, really deeply compelling. Yeah. And... I I feel like I've seen 
Josh Segarra in something else, but nothing looks familiar. Oh, that's right, Pug on, on She-Hulk, Attorney at Law. Yeah, he's, he's great there, he's great here. And... Yeah, so the the dialogue is really great, and both yeah, both writing and delivery really really strong. The cinematography is handled by Brett Jutkiewicz, who also DP'd Scream Five, The Black Phone, and Ready or Not. So. It's, you know, he's worked with the director duo on three movies now. And, yeah, it's, you know, Scream 6, Scream 5, The Black Phone, and Raider or Not are all very, very well shot. And, yeah, I, I feel like they, they did a really great job of capturing, like, you know, the, the threat... And the, the, yeah, like, the cold and sort of inherently uncaring atmosphere of, of New York. I realize I'm making it sound like not a great place. I'm sure, I, I know that there are some people who are very, very happy to live in New York. I'm just saying, for a horror movie, it's kind of important that you capture the parts of it that make it scary and yeah I felt like they did a really good job on that here without it feeling like they were trying to force a, a square peg in a round hole you know they found something and captured it rather than that so this was edited by Michael Aller who also edited Scream 5 so yeah has worked with the director of duo before. He also edited the first Shazam movie, which he did an incredible job on, and Paranormal Activity, The Ghost Dimension. And he, he has edited other movies, including other horror movies. Not any that I have watched, though. But yeah, he does a really good job. Like, editing horror is very, very uh, difficult, because you really got to make sure... <sighs> Horror, it's kind of like if you've ever tried, like, frying something in a, in a pan. You gotta, if, if, you, if you just, like, crank the, 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 um, the gas, if you, if you really, really, like, if you try to do it, like, yeah, if you, if you go too far too fast, you're gonna ruin it. It, you know, that's not scary. If you go too slow, it's just not gonna get there and people are gonna be bored. It's not scary. What you gotta do is you gotta slowly get to the right spot and then you gotta keep it frying for at, at the right the right intensity for the right amount of time, then you end up with a, a well fried dish you know, it's scary, and that's, yeah, he, he does a really, really solid job here. And, you know, the, the, none of the scenes felt like they went on for too long. There is no scene that I really felt needed to be trimmed. And that brings us to so the the budget is let's see estimated to be 35 million and let's see so yeah uh, worldwide gross is 143 million so yeah quite the the profit and let's see. yeah I felt like they did a, a good job making Alberta 
uh, oh, hold on, Quebec, Montreal, uh, look like New York. Uh, I haven't spent a huge amount of time in New York, but I have watched a lot of stuff that was actually shot there, and yeah, this, this felt like, yeah. And... Yeah, it delivers on, you know, fighting back against Ghostface, Ghostface killing people in really gruesome ways, the the chases are really great, and scenes of suspense are very effective. Now, the music is also really great, and it was composed by Bryant Tyler, who also scored Scream 5 and Ready or Not, so experience working with this director and he has done other horror scores uh, let's see yeah um yeah very very good score and great sound design like some of the kills have really really gnarly sound yeah. And. Yeah. Uh, the movie is. If you if you don't count the end credits. It is just. Short of. Two hours. Uh, let's see. About. I guess. Yeah. An hour and 57 minutes or so. And. Yeah, if you're in a situation where you're, you know, you could walk out without it really bothering people, or if you don't care about that, you know, whatever. Yeah, I would probably, I would give the movie at least 30 minutes. And if, if at that point nothing, then I'm not sure there's really going to be anything after that that will really grab you. So, the best element is more scream and doing, you know, getting something that's just different enough. It's not alienating. It's not too different, but it's just different enough that it doesn't feel like you know, yeah, I quote, you know, at least one critic said that it was like treading water. I really didn't feel like it was. I felt like it was, you know, a bold new chapter. And, yeah, I think they could definitely build on this. You know, they can keep making these. It's, it's you know, which is something that you want from, you know, the movie itself has Mindy say, we're a franchise now, you know. And, yeah, I could I could definitely see how they could make an another one in in you know yeah maybe next year you know we'll yeah and uh let's see the the worst aspect i guess see this is the part i i try to force myself to say at least one really negative thing about a movie to to keep it from being just nonstop love fest. Ah, uh, I don't know that I. I suppose yeah. If if I had to point to something and say, yeah, I I, it could be more original. I I don't think that it needed to be. I don't think it's a big deal. But I, I can see how, like, for, for sure, you know, if if recently when you go to see a slasher movie, you feel like we've had so many slasher movies, you got to do something different, you know. Halloween Kills does something different. Halloween Ends does something different. Ultimately, this really, not not to the extent that those do, at least, this movie does not take as big of a chance as those movies do. Now, uh, yeah, the the something I saw a lot of other people really hate was the ending, and yeah, I disagree. 
thing I was most worried about was the shift in setting, and I think they did a really, really solid job with that. Like, yeah. You know, the... the uh, Jason Takes Manhattan is not the only time that that franchise leaves the woods, and they did get some good stuff out of the other times they left the woods, but I don't think they ever got, they never did as well as this does. You know, th those were movies that really were very married to the setting. Now, the thing I was most looking forward to was more from this duo of directors and writers, and yeah, I like I'm I'm really really impressed by Radio Silence. I I yeah, if if at some point they tire of doing screen movies or you know for whatever reason they they stop, I will probably be watching the next thing they do you know pretty much regard like i i don't at at this point they've now one like they've made three of my favorite horror movies yeah i i um they i would really have to be like there would have to be something major to to talk me out of watching something of theirs the trailers do give too much away but it's not one of those cases where if you watch the trailer don't even bother watching the movie you know everything that's not at all and let's see it is one of those things where it's it's difficult to advertise a slasher movie without spoiling at least something and, f like, I would definitely say if you like the trailers, you're very likely to also like the movie. And the cover and poster do not give too much away. And some of the covers and posters are very much worth looking up on IMDb. And that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes, where it has a 77 percent from critics based on 275 reviews 212 fresh 63 rotten the average uh, critic rating is 6.70 out of 10 the audience score is 91 percent based on over 2500 verified ratings the average rating is 4.5 out of 5 yeah this is definitely a a crowd pleaser and the critics consensus a certain aspect of horror's most murderously meta franchise may be going stale but a change of setting and some inventive set pieces help keep scream 6 reasonably sharp the audience says building upon the requel and even improving on it with the lovable core 4 and some gnarly kills this sequel is a total scream and on Metacritic, it has a 61 out of 100 based on 53 critic reviews, 31 positive, 19 mixed, 3 negative. And let's see. Yeah, uh, one of them says that it's not actually scary, there's just, it's too focused on the comedy. And one of them says that the joking has run its course. And one of them says that the final scenes apparently kill the, the franchise. But yeah. And on, on Metacritic, the users have given it 7.5 out of 10. Based on 99 ratings, 77 of them are positive, 13 are mixed, 9 are negative, and there's only one negative review. Let's see. And um, uh, 
Yeah, I'm not really seeing anything. <laughs> yeah, the this um Yeah, this person says, you know, they should be worried that they're they don't end up like Michael Myers or Ghostface should be worried when it ends like Michael Myers. But yeah, so that brings us to IMDb, where it has a seven point one out of ten, based on over thirty seven thousand votes. 23.4 gave it 7, 22.9% gave it 8, 17.1 gave it 10, 12.5 gave it 6, 10.8 gave it 9, 5.2 gave it 5. I have a hard time understanding why anyone gave it below a 5, but 2.7 gave it 4, 2.6 gave it 1, 1 1.7 gave it 3, 1.1 gave it 2. But yeah, by and large, very positively received movie. And right, that brings us to the... There are 470 user reviews, or 303, without spoilers on IMDb. And the top 100, three of them gave it a 1 out of 10, two gave it 2. 3 gave it 3, 7 gave it 4, 11 gave it 5, 6 gave it 6, 12 gave it 7, 28 gave it 8, 19 gave it 9, and 20 gave it 10. So yeah, very positively received. And let's see, there are... There we go. Yeah. Yeah, the special effects are really, really good. And you can tell that the, like, kill scenes tend to use, like, practical effects. And, yeah, it just makes it much more convincing and visceral. Some really excellent stunt work. And, yeah, for, for sure, like, if you... If one of the things you look for in a horror movie that you want to, if you're considering watching a horror movie, you want to make sure it has like some really memorable violence and and such. For sure, it does. Like there are things that you're gonna you're gonna walk out of the theater. You're gonna be talking to your friends about, you know, several of the, you know, there's yeah, there's a lot of really memorable violence in in this now let's see the right so um, yes I rate this eight slashing sequels out of ten and yeah, like um, I could watch this again like tomorrow. I, I probably won't. I very rarely go to the movie theater to see the same movie more than once. But yeah, um, this is definitely something I'm going to be rewatching and I look forward to it. And yeah, uh, fully updated ranking. So worst to best, all of the screen movies. Keeping in mind, I love all of them. Three, two, four, one, five, and six. This is my new favorite of the screen movies. And that brings us to the thoughts section. So starting with notes taken while watching. And they are on the pad of paper as usual. So I really, really, 
I love the opening. Um, and that's, you know, probably the only opening to a screen movie that I love is the third movies. And, yeah, I, I like, you know, they do, the, they, they did the thing. They do the thing where you hear the, the ringing phone and you hear a, a woman scream and then you see a phone be picked up and that's not it's it's not Ghostface. It's just it's you know there it's this it's this bar called Hasta el Fuego. See you on fire? Is that a wait? Is that a reference to? I feel like I heard that some other what. Until the fire. Oh, that's right. That was where. I, okay, so that has nothing to do with this movie, anyway. Um, but but yeah, you know, it's a it's a bar, and it picks up the phone. And it's just yeah. And we have Samara weaving, and she's you know texting, and you know apparently Jason can't find the. Yeah, Jason can't find the the bar, and so you know he you know he he asks he, you know politely, can I call you? You know, and she she you know she makes sure. Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm looking at the front of the bar right now. It's it's definitely red. And he's like, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing anything red here. You know, and just yeah, and and. I feel like they did hear something that Scream 3 tried to do. Scream 3 wanted this thing of of the... I forget if I said... Yeah, spoilers throughout the rest of the video. Anyway, in Scream 3, we have this thing of the voice changer being able to you know, sound like members of the main cast and major characters, but also Ghostface. And in this, you know, Jason does use the the voice changer, but that really was him. And I really just yeah, because when he when he calls her and he's like, I'm I'm not seeing any is no, that's that's not you. That's a that's a guy with a knife, you know, and, and just you know, and then he takes the mask off after killing her and that's that's Tony Revolori Re, yeah you know you he has a very distinct voice and face and the the, the yeah i i they they did a really really great job on on that and let's see yeah and and you know she she says that the reason she teaches slasher movies is that the the tropes, uh, you know, allow for outsider art, which is, you know, of course how the, yeah, they they got just yeah. It wouldn't be a scream movie if it didn't open with a horror movie aficionado being called up by Ghostface, so just, yeah, and, and the, you know, the thing with the, the alley, and, and, you know, it's like, is, is that you? No? Can, can you wave? No? No, that's not, that's not you. He's, he's staring at me, and just, uh, and, you know, sh and, and he says, I can't believe, even though you teach slasher movies, you still let yourself be lured into an alley. And, yeah, Sa Samara Weaving delivers her incredible scream. Like, just, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, incredible. And the, the,
we've all seen in the other screen movies we've all seen you know the mask comes off and we see a, a character and like but to have it happen at the start of the movie and to have it be a character that we haven't already seen you know we we've heard his voice but we didn't see his face before and i honestly i was like wondering if the the if tony was going to be if if jason was going to be the killer for the rest of the movie and then you know the open like it's not the first screen movie where the open actually yeah i guess huh I guess each Scream movie opens with the killing of... No, wait, yeah, yeah. Most Scream movies open with the killing of two people who have some sort of relationship with each other. But the... the yeah, Scream 5, there's only an attack on one person. And then here, you know, technically three people are killed, but with, you know, with one of them, it's completely off screen. Off screen off screen you know and and yeah then you have the tony you know he's he's attacked by i i think i'm just going to be saying ghost face instead of i think they did maybe say which of them it was in the ending of the movie who who specifically killed jason and his his friend there but anyway but yeah, you know, it's, I I I really admire like that. This is the kind of the movie actually opens with two ghost faces being killed, and one of the ghost faces killed someone, and we thought that was gonna be the the big because like yeah, just they they really do a great job, just completely subverting expectations. I would never have guessed that that a screen movie would open with the death of multiple ghost faces. You know, even one, much less multiple. You know, and and he stabs Mara Weaving and says, "Now I see something red," which is a great callback. And yeah, you know, we see he cleans after the kill and we see he knows Tara, Tara so there's a implied threat there Let's see and yeah he, he talks about the kill with the person he thinks is his partner and yeah you know it's clear he's you know it's it's this thing of you know oh he's he's watched too many horror movies kind of thing and honestly that thing of like what did it feel like and he says the more I stabbed her the less human she became the more she became a piece of me holy fucking shit that's horrifying that's just and and yeah I mean honestly did they, is that like a paraphrase or quote from a real serial killer? That does legitimately sound like something a serial killer would say. And yeah, they tell me, you know, what, what are we doing here? We got to finish Richie's movie by killing the Carpenter sisters, right? And yeah, at the end, we, we learned that the problem was, it, it wasn't that the... You know the reason that the the ghost face the the Richie's family at the end of the movie the reason that they killed Jason and and the other guy was that the well actually I'm not sure why they killed the other guy but they killed Jason because they didn't want him to kill the the Samara Weaving character if I understand correctly and I love the line who gives a fuck about movies which is a great way to open a movie and let's see yeah and and we see that Sam 
Carpenter is in therapy, and, you know, for a while she's been avoiding using the details, but, you know, he keeps asking, so, okay, fine, and she, she divulges, you know, and, like, at first, you can tell that he's like, oh, yeah, uh-huh, sure, serial killer, and then you kill some, yeah, mm-hmm, Oh, uh, fuck. Why did I why did I ask for details? I might as well have just told her lie to my face. Waste my time. Ugh, okay. And and then eventually, you know, I is it maybe when she says, you know, I'm I'm not in therapy for for killing someone. I'm in therapy because it felt right. You know, and then he's like, "Okay. Um you know, I think I might have left the oven on in another state, so tell you what, I'm going to get you in touch with one of my colleagues and you're going to be taken care of for, for sure, that, yeah, and, and, you know, we get a brief Scream 5 recap of the, you know, through the this detail, just in case people haven't, you know, and, and for sure, like, if you didn't watch, if you've only watched Scream 5 once, and that was like a year ago, yeah, you might need a, a quick recap. And, yeah, Sam goes home, she has three locks on the door, and... She tries to call Tara, and Tara's <laughs> Tara's answering machine is this really bratty teen. Like, why are you calling me? Why aren't you texting me? It's just I don't know. I I it probably shouldn't make me me laugh as much as it does, but it it does. And and you know you hear some some like a, a noise in the apartment, and it's like. Is that is that a woman like you know get, um, scared or or being attacked or something? And then you realize, oh, it's it's sex noises. And <laughs> I I didn't catch his name because apparently it's not Paul. But I I quite like the the you know and and one hundred percent sure you know she's sex positive. That's great. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a woman, you know, having multiple partners. Although, the fact that not Paul is so... Oh, Paul 2.0. That's, that's his character name. Yeah, the fact that he didn't, apparently didn't know that she was with multiple... That's not great. Don't, don't lie to your partner. Uh, but... The, the fact that, yeah, um, but the fact that, you know, so, so the, yeah, um, you know, the, the roommate realizes, oh, it was, well, it was a little too loud, wasn't it? And then, you know, uh, uh Quinn, yeah, Qu Quinn is like, was, too too loud, too loud. I'm sorry, you know. And and Sam is like, so um, Paul. No, and and you just hear the voice from, who the fuck's Paul? <laughs> that was really really funny. Just the, the just, yeah, and and like I've seen that joke done before. I don't think I've seen it done where it's a woman. Say so. So that's a that's a great twist. You know, there's a they've done that joke at least once on, or they did that joke at least once on Two and a Half Men, where you know Charlie Sheen, sorry Harper, was you know, oh, is that that girl? And you know, he said no, and and the girl was like giggling, and then she stops when she hears that there's a, a different. So yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't think I, 
did we maybe very briefly see Paul 2.0's face when he had like been stabbed in the um what's it called in the um in the bathtub but other than that like yeah I really don't know any yeah but that was yeah I I quite like that and yeah I liked when Quinn told Sam I'm I'm sorry I I don't know if your sister went armed to the college part you know just yeah great and let's see yeah and Tara wants to go to the room of this guy that she literally just met and you know keeps telling you know mul multiple of her friends show up to say you know what why don't why don't we just we're gonna be we're gonna be fine uh, Tara why don't you come with us and you know you don't have to go with 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 this guy and then <laughs> and then Sam shows up and I kind of love that she announces she informs before she you know she, so you know I, I forget exactly what she said but she definitely says I'm gonna taste your balls now and and she does stay the fuck away from my sister you know and Tara points out that's actually super embarrassing like you know people are probably like think uh Tara, she's like, she's fragile, she's made of China, you know, everywhere she goes, Sam follows her and, and starts attacking people, you know, so, yeah, I, I really appreciated this, a very, very credible relationship between the two, and, you know, basically Tara says, yes, I know, it would have been a mistake to go with that guy, but it would have been my mistake, I want to be allowed to make my mistakes. I don't want you helicopter parenting me. And let's see. Yeah, and I appreciate, you know, Tara actually thanks Chad for, you know, at, at the time she was like, leave me alone. But, you know, she does. I, I really love when these movies have people acknowledge, you know what? I made a mistake. You were right. You tried to help me. You know, the just... There's so many movies where people will say or do something awful and then not really apologize, not really... seemingly not need to be forgiven. It's just... Yeah, I, I really, really appreciate that they... You know, and... Tara and Chad almost kiss, and then Quinn shows up to cockblock, and she says the word cockblock like two or three times in within like a few seconds. It just yeah. Let's see. And the see. yeah, and and we find out you know. Once Sam realizes about the, you know, the attacks on, on Jason and, and such, you know, Sam wants Tara and her to leave New York. And I really appreciate, you know, Tara is like, okay, can we, can we please consider another option before throwing my education out the window? Because that really is, like, you know, and that's, again, like, so many of these movies don't even acknowledge, like, no, like, that's not, you can't just do that, you know, like, it would be great if you could, but you gotta, you gotta be realistic about these things. And... Yeah, and, and the, you know, someone calls on the cell, and, oh, it's apparently Gail Weathers and she you know she doesn't answer but then Richie's number and 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 that is legitimately a clever cuz you know at the end we find out yeah it's Richie's family you know so they would want her to think it's Richie and 
yeah, the the convenience store scene is incredible. Like when there's glass on the floor and they have to crawl, super suspenseful, and just yeah, in incredible. The the yeah, it just, and and it's it's this thing of like a convenience store, you know. I don't know that it's necessarily a place that you normally feel super safe, but it's not a place where you'd expect, like, a serial killer with a knife to show up and start killing people, you know. So that was a really, really great kind of just, yeah. And, yeah, the cops suspect Tara and Sam, and they both suspect the the uh, detective Bailey and you know he says I mean the the you know I'm 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 really I really got to protect Quinn and then at the end of the movie we find out that both of them are in fact the the you know two of the of the three killers so yeah it's, it's the the Oh, that's what, yeah, I was wondering where I'd seen Jack Champion. He played Spider in Avatar The Way of Water and Kid on Bike in Avengers Endgame. Wow, that's... In, in very, very little time he went from, like, I mean, sure, I remember Kid on Bike in Avengers Endgame, but that's a tiny role compared to these two. But, yeah. Uh, he's really, really talented, so I'm glad that he is. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, let's see. What was the other thing that I wanted to see? Um, yeah, we find out that Kirby knows uh, Sam from high school, which makes sense. You know, they were, what was it, like, there was two or three years between them or something like that and that's yeah and yeah the the I, I really like that you know yeah one you know because they are suspect that's right yeah the reason Bailey said you can't leave New York you're you know your person's your Persons of interest or suspects or something like that. It's because he's one of the killers. He wants to make sure that they don't leave because that would completely fuck things up for the three of them. So so yeah. But yeah, the um, uh, what's it called? Yeah, you know, after they've been told that uh, Sam and Tara leave through the the door and the press is standing there waiting and you know, asking these really awful questions that you shouldn't have to be able to, you know, in, in a situation like that. And, yeah, that it feels like, a, a, you know, yeah, very similar scene in Scream 1, and in that one, Sydney punches Gale, and here, Sam tries to punch her, and then Tara does punch her. And I really loved later when... You know, Tara is like, I'm sorry, I hit you. No, you're not. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I really, really, really like Jenna Ortega. Let's see. And... Yeah, and, we, you know, we find out that, you know, Gail promised that she wouldn't write about the events of Scream 5, than she did, and they really hate her for that. So that's, you know, Gail is still breaking people's trust about stuff like that. So that, you know, yeah. And the therapist is attacked. And, yeah, Mindy talks about it's a franchise. It's not a sequel anymore. Main characters can die, and... 
she lists all these examples and on some level I kind of would have thought it was it would be cool if they did kill off like yeah you know one of the core four ultimately they they didn't uh, yeah I, I don't know and some you know some things you don't have to you don't have to subvert all expectations now Yeah, and the thing with, you know, the, the Easter eggs and DNA, right, and we, you know, the, the um, Detective Bailey checks on Kirby, and then later, you know, later on he claims that Kirby, like, lost her mind after the Woodsboro, you know, it's... And, and is no longer FBI kind of thing. You know, the way I see it, it wasn't just for the audience's benefit that he asked another cop to check on Kirby. He wanted to see if there legit was something he could use against her. And when he found out, ah, oh, she's, she's clean, well, I'll just make something up. You know, y yeah, the way I see it, probably he was hoping that there would be something the uh, let's see if if he could actually yeah maybe it was just like to know as much about her as possible so that he would have an easier time of taking her out that's probably yeah and Chad is the only person who likes the idea of their nickname being the core for and yeah that was that was fun Let's see, and yeah, Sam is considered the prime suspect by the press because of, you know, the phones recorded, you know, it looked like she was rushing to attack, you know, this, this other girl, and you can't, you know, because of how they edited that video, you can't tell that it, you know, the other girl... Uh, what's slushied her? Is that what it's called? You know, the the that kind of thing. You know, so it just looks like she's suddenly rushing at this, you know, poor defenseless girl, and you know, she. We know that she's related to a serial killer, and some people are saying, just asking questions, but some people are saying that maybe she was the one who killed all those people and like the the guy that she was with he had no idea just you know which is also such a great cuz it is the the um what's it called the um you know the the uh hold on what's the thing yeah what when uh, very frequently when a woman is victimized or and or defends herself you know you have a ton of people online you know trying desperately to to make it that oh no, no she wasn't she wasn't really victimized or she you know they or they'll they'll victim blame or they'll say you know that yeah, so so that was yeah, I felt like the the this movie did a good job commenting on that. I love that the core four support each other. Let's see, and I, I like that, you know, once you know, Sam is like, uh, I mean, they're really trusting, okay. I've been having sex with what is it they keep calling him? Cute guy? D Danny. And like there's there's this like second of of just complete silence, and then everyone is like, I knew it, you know. It's just like everybody, everyone knew that she was having sex. Just you know, every and apparently all of them realized independently of each other. So that's yeah, quality. Sam, your stealth ability is. Second to none. Nobody.
can hide things better than you. Let's see. And yeah, you know, Ghostface attacks the sex positive roommate Quinn, and we have some off screen killing. I really appreciate, like, this is a slasher movie that actually understands sometimes it is scarier if we don't see the the kill and it's like you know you you it almost sounds like counterintuitive or like ah you're just trying to save money no 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 like legit the fact that Danny spots you know and then he like bang on the window and you know has to open the window I yeah I see you motherfucker you know and and then he tries calling. Sam and you know Terry say, "Ah, it's the boyfriend calling. What are your intentions towards my sister?" <laughs> Which is very funny. That is especially coming from Tara, you know, who like what twenty minutes of movie ago was gonna go have sex with a random stranger because he said, "No, no, no, I have I have liquor in my room." But just yeah, and and the the yeah, so you know, and and he so instead Danny sends like a a picture he grabs that shows Ghostface, you know, yeah. So so yeah, Ghostface went into the the bathroom to kill the guy in the in the tub or shower or something like that, and then went out to to stage killing Quinn. And yeah, we don't really see Quinn. Be, you know, we just we see a, a blurry photo of Ghostface behind. You know, and then we just kind of accept. Oh, I guess she's dead. And just yeah, and and also, you know, Mindy running through the bathroom and seeing. Oh wow! Oh, he is so fucking dead. <laughs> that was also quite funny. And yeah, very very intense scene. And they have to move between the two apartment windows, crawling across, praying to the Latter Day Saints that it will hold. And I do really appreciate, like, you know, people when the trailer hit, people were like, "Really?" And they do acknowledge that in the movie. You know, he's, he's like, "No, I, I have an idea." You know, Danny's like, "I have an idea," and he, you know, he's got the the ladder and he pushes it, to, and Sam is like. Are you fucking kidding me? And and he's like, "Do you have a better idea?" You know, and apparently, like some people are like, "Oh, why don't you just hold the door?" Have you not watched one of these movies? Like, you gotta get the fuck away from Ghostface, or he will fucking kill you. There's really no like, there's yeah. I anyway, but yeah. So and and super tense and suspenseful with the with the ladder and you know when. Annika is is trying to cross the ladder, you know. Ghostface shakes the ladder, and she does. And you know, despite how much she fights to to stay on, she does end up flying off. And and not you know, they don't. It's not just like oh, you know, she she landed and just, no, no, we see her her head like smack against was it like a dumpster or something like so metal, you know, and she's flying through the. Yeah, she's dead. She's even if you didn't see the massive pool of blood afterwards. And I think it's Danny who says, "Trust no one." And uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna be right back, which is a thing you're not supposed to say. And Bailey wants revenge for Quinn, which is how you know. Yeah, that's why he's there the rest of the time. It certainly isn't that he's one of the killers. I, I really hadn't guessed that he was one of the killers, uh, much less Ethan. And... Yeah, and, and then we reach, you know, Terrace. Yeah, Terrace, like, I'm sorry I hit you. And Gail's like, no, you're not. You're right, I'm not. I... Jenna Ortega as Tara, like, admitting, okay, in screen movies, 
really, really solid. I absolutely love that. That was, you know, in the first, in, in Scream 5, it was, you know, when, when Sam is like, you're really high, aren't you? Yeah, I, I won't deny it. Let's see, and... Yeah, you know, Gale managed to find the place that was rented by the killers at the start of the film. The shrine and theater. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and you know, Sam imagines Billy and... Billy is like, you know, he, he's encouraging her to kill more. And. Yeah, absolutely love Kirby and Mindy talking about horror series. You know, so the, let's see, there was some stuff they agreed on, but like. When it came to the, um, uh, what's it called? They disagreed on Friday the 13th, and that was because Kirby had a, she had a crush on Corey. Which of the Corey's? Corey Feldman, right. And, you know, because of that, she preferred the fourth to the second. And that was also like, I've, I was also sitting there like, really? The fourth one? Over the second one? And then, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. If you're, you know, you had a crush on Corey Feldman, I, you know, yeah. So, so that was a, a great, yeah. Now, that, yeah, I really appreciate, I, I, I'm really glad, this is not the first to do it, but I really, really appreciate it. When a uh, major movie, you know, communicates found family can be extremely important if, you know, your biological family can't completely deliver for you, you know, I think it was Kirby or it was a Gale. And anyway, someone asked, what about the mother of Tara and Sam? And their mother refused to talk to Sam because of, uh, you know what, I don't remember the exact details, but she disowned, she disowned Sam, and then Tara didn't want anything to do with, with the mother because she disowned Sam, and yeah, you know, now she has... You know the the two of the the two sisters have each other. They have the twins, and yeah. Let's see. And yeah, Mindy thinks that Kirby isn't careful enough, and that with the the trace thing, you know, and she's like, Randy died in this exact situation, you know, which is again. That they're pointing out, we're doing this again. You know, we're doing the thing, and again, like that primes you to think, oh, oh, I see where this is going. One of the people in the broad daylight in the park is going to be killed by ghosts. Oh no, never mind. No, Ghostface is nowhere near where they are. He's he's near Gale. You know, that was that's such a great, just completely. Um, yeah, because that's that's not at all what happens in in the corresponding scene in Scream Two, you know. So so that was a great and and yeah, you know. Once we've watched the entire movie, we do realize no, technically, you know, the two of the three ghost faces of the movie, Bailey and Ethan, were you know right there, but. They couldn't have possibly hit, and and it's this clever thing. Of, you know, they they said no press allowed, and it is like you know, she's been really, really like it's, how much do they want to trust her right now? She betrayed their trust last time, but you know, maybe it'll get her killed. So that's yeah. 
And, yeah, you know, Ghostface points out it's actually the first time that Gale and Ghostface have had a call. And, yeah, it's it's excellent. And it really is, like, the the kind of just, yeah, um, absolutely amazing. The, the call and the chase and the, it's just, yeah. Um, let's see, there was another thing. Thing. But yeah, you know, that's how you show respect to a an ongoing series like this. You know, find something that hasn't been done but would be super interesting to do. And yeah, like honestly, when when he said it, you know, there was like a second where I was like, what about Scream Oh no, wait, yeah. They didn't talk on the phone. The the you know, the so so yeah, I really really appreciate that they they managed to find something there that's just yeah and you know the the gun was a really great the um yeah you know she she gets into this this room and she's got a gun and she she's responsible she has it in a locked box where she, you know, she knows the code, but, like, a burglar couldn't use it against her, for example, or, you know, nobody, um, it's not going to be used by someone who shouldn't be using it, basically, but it also means that she is struggling to get it in, in time, you know, it's, it's somewhat similar to the, what was it, like, the 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 uh, cell phone tracking sharing thing in in Scream Five, where you know his bloody finger can't uh, you know undo the the tracking thing. Hold, please. <laughs> that's amazing. That's and that's exactly you know that's the kind of thing that Gail Weathers does in a yeah. And. Yeah, uh, Sam and Tara, you know, get to, to Gail, and Gail says, Tell Sydney, Ghostface never got me. You know, so that, so that Sydney wouldn't feel guilty over not, you know, c coming to, to rescue her. And Sam straight up says, you know, she she's she's just gonna give herself up. And and Tara says, uh, you know, no. Now let let me protect you, the way that you keep you know. And yeah, so they they talk about you know if they can lure the ghost face into a place, they can execute him. And we get to the, the subway scene, and they, you know, they end up getting separated, and, you know, very, very tense scene. And, yeah, we're told, you know, ten stops, and there's a lot of people coming and going, so it's difficult, you know. And a lot of ghost faces in the, the place, but one of them, you know, gets closer and closer to Mindy and attacks and then she says I got it wrong again fuck this franchise and they talk about the, the kill box there's only one weapon it's Kirby, Kirby's gun because she has a badge she's in control which is then of course you know when we hear, oh, you know, she was taken up, she's no longer FBI, you know, then you think, oh, no, you know, of course, that's why she didn't want anyone else to have a gun, because that is the kind of thing in one of these movies, you know, if you say that nobody should arm themselves, even though there's a killer out there, that's very sus, you know, so, no, instead, but it is actually, like, you know, I have a lot of issues with law enforcement but it is technically true like you don't want a bunch of people 
individually running around with their own weapons. You want to control things. You want to you want to avoid chaos. You know, so very very clever. Because like legit, if you ask an FBI agent, you know, like nine out of ten will tell you yes. What Kirby said is exactly what I would do in that exact circumstance. You know, and and the the tenth one is is a renegade rogue who doesn't play by the rules and I don't have anywhere else to go with that joke. And the let's see um yeah, the 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 fact that you know Billy gets Sam to grab a weapon and you know clear the place yourself. And yeah, the you know Bailey claims that Kirby was fired two months ago is no longer FBI. And, you know, also when, like, when Kirby reappears and she's like, whatever he's told you about me is a lie, you know, that, like, we're like, eh, I mean, that is exactly the kind of thing that a liar would say, you know, but then he shoots Kirby and the, the, and Ghostface walks up. And that was also, like, for, for a few seconds, it's like, Ghostface is behind Bailey, he's gonna say, oh, it's, they're on the same side. And Chad and Tara kiss, and yeah, it's it's legitimately sweet. And Chad fights Ghostface, which was something that you know in Scream Five we might figure would happen because he's the big jock, but actually he didn't particularly fight. Like he gets lured by Ghostface. And, and attacked. And Chad is stabbed by two ghost faces, both in mask and costume, at the same time, which is a first. And the the part where they are, like, synchronized... Let's see, is it... I think they're doing the, the thing where they, like, remove the blood from the blade with their gloved hand. That, some Something like that. But they're, like, in perfect sync, which is... Yeah, and, like, what, five minutes later, you were told, yeah, they're siblings. Okay, yeah, I can I can believe that they can do it completely, and, you know, because that would take some, some skill or practice or something, but, yeah. You know, like, it's... Hopefully it wasn't always cleaning knives of, of other people's blood, but, yeah, you know, like, a lot of parents will... To try to get the the whole family working as a unit. So yeah, and yeah, it's revealed who the ghost faces are, and we're told, you know, I think it's Bailey who says we never believed that conspiracy, but we did start it. In other words, evil people start conspiracy theories about people who have been victimized or and or are trying to do good like say what you will about Sam in Scream 5 she's not trying to hurt people she just wants to protect her sister and you know for this whole thing to to be resolved you know And I like the, the you know one of them points out today it's you know character assassination that's uh, you know and and yeah that is absolutely true like today a lot of the the worst things you know a, a lot of people have their character assassinated on the internet and that is something that's happening today to a lot of important people in a way that just wasn't in, for example, 1996 when this series started. And, yeah, we find out that they're Richie's family, and it's, yeah, family members that want revenge like in Scream 2. 
where it was Billy's uh, Billy's mother that wanted revenge, and the the what's it called? Um, uh, right on the tip of my tongue. Um, yeah, and in this, you know, they're trying to get revenge on a relative of Billy Loomis. So yeah. And Sam manages to provoke Bailey in a in a way that resembles the way that Sydney would provoke um, I forget her name, but Mrs. Loomis, you know, Billy's mother, and yeah, and they use bricks to attack and some gunfire and Tara. I really love the, you know, you gotta let me go, and she, you know, yeah, she, she gets the, the knife and, you know, stabs him right in the fucking mouth. Yikes! And did she, did, am I remembering right, didn't she also, like, twist the blade a little? Holy shit! That's horrific, and, yeah, the, the, yeah, and then she's like, Die a fucking virgin. <laughs> that was a weird overshare. And the, the, yeah, you know, that is the resolution of their, you know, the, the big thing was Sam can't stop. She, she feels the need to protect Tara constantly, but Tara is not a baby she can you know sure there are situations where it is necessary for Sam to protect her but there's also a lot of situations where she can fend for her. and and we've seen that throughout the movie you know she she does fight back you know so yeah give her a knife and she can you know stop um i'm going to keep going him Ethan because i do not remember what they might they might have said what his name was in reality but anyway and let's see yeah and and then it's it's Bailey and yeah, the call with the ghost face voice let's see and yeah and and you know t Tara uh, Sam is, you know, stabbing Bailey, and then Tara shows up, and it's that thing of, you know, is she going to become the the killer? Which I I can't help but wonder. I do think it would be super interesting if maybe next time or one of the next times, if Sam does. I mean, I don't know that. I don't know if I would love for her to be, like, the killer, but if they could do, like, a thing, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but further exploration of her being, because that would be really, really cool, and it is, you know, there are a couple of slasher series that have hinted, next movie, the killer is gonna be this kid or at least young person who you know used to be normal and now they're going to be a killer and then they you know most of these slasher sequels end up chickening out on that you know it it would be pretty cool if they you know but but I do really like Sam as like not a villain so but but yeah you know, and, and, he's, so yeah, Tara shows up, and, you know, Sam says, I'm not, I'm not what you think I am, or something like that, to, to Bailey, but she's still, you know, and, and, yeah, from, from Tara's look, she does, you know, but you'd fuck with my family, and stabs him in the fucking eye, holy shit. And yeah, and and one of the the ghost face, I was it the yeah the the uh, Ethan, 
Yeah, cause yeah, cause uh, Quinn got shot in the head, and so so yeah, Ethan comes, yeah, comes running, and then Kirby manages to to knock the the TV onto him to kill him, like how Stu was was killed in the first one. So that's great, and it's I mean I guess at this point we're probably not gonna see Stu in in one of these, as fun as that would be, but. I really do appreciate that reference, and you know f they do the the horror movie thing where the, you know are they gonna become a killer because she's got the the mask from Ghostface right there and it, you know and then Tara's like you coming you know and okay and she tosses the mask on the on the ground and goes to be with Tara. And let's see. Yeah, and and you know, and and Mindy shows up. I know who the killers are, and she and she mentions them. What, you are now, Did I miss the monologue again? I'm on a lot of drugs. And yeah, and the the post credit scene is just like six seconds, maybe. And it's just Mindy saying, not every movie needs a post credit scene. Cut to black. Love it. Absolutely. I, I get why some people might have been frustrated. That's all we're going to get. But I, I, and I'll acknowledge, I've been, like, there have been other movies that delivered very little at the end of where I was really, I, I thought it was absolutely perfect here. Now, that is it for that section. So, the final section is notes taken before watching and I am here we go so yeah I was wondering if this movie would have a legacy character die since that does happen in two three five not four and I was uh, let's see no no that does not happen uh, let's see, did I end up, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, some people have said that they felt way too many people survived, like, you know, attacks that really should have killed them in this movie, yeah, that is, that is true, um, Chad, Mindy, Gail, I guess, were there others? Maybe, yeah, maybe also Kirby got seemed like she got pretty badly hurt, and then you know, I, I, yeah, it's it's true, and yeah, it's really difficult. You know, it's it's that thing of the. Um, you know the the um, the the characters are why we we care why we're not just like there's a there's countless movies that you could watch if all you want is to sit down for ninety plus minutes and see a bunch of people get killed you know that's not difficult to find but a lot of these movies don't make you care about the characters and that's why I highlighted you know that's why I said that I think that the Nightmare on Elm Street movies are better than the Friday the 13th movies you know and why I think Halloween 1978 is a really strong movie you know now uh, right so another thing I was wondering if if a legacy character would turn out to be the killer since that would be the first And that also was not the case. Um, let's see. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Scream 5 is like a riff or remake of 1. And in some ways, this does feel like uh, 2. Scream 2, but... Let's see. 
So the motivation in each of these films has to do with revenge and an obsession with how the American media handles real-life violent events. And... Yeah, um, the endings of the first, fifth, and this are epic, and yeah, I, I know, I, I realize not everybody's going to agree with me on that, but I don't think that 2, 3, and 4 have endings that really measure up to 1, 5 in this. I, I, I wish they did, and, and certainly... The uh, like I'll grant that Scream Two like there's a lot of elements in the the last chunk of the movie, you know, but it just does not it does not reach the heights of the first one with them stabbing each other and suddenly Sydney has is is calling them using the the voice modulator, it just yeah and and the the yeah, I've yeah I've already talked about the the how wild the ending of this one gets, and the fifth one you have the the thing with the 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 killers separate from each other trying to find and and suddenly Tara you know attacks. I still like the Babadook better. I just yeah. Now, right, I really love that the ghost face mask looks worn, aged, not as much, obviously, as Halloween 2018, but baby steps in that direction. I really appreciate it, because, you know, go back and watch all the others, it's pristine white, you know, and, and that was, like, they got, they got effective horror out of that, because a mask is inherently, you know, especially one that... So like you you can't you can't see someone's eyes and you can't really see their facial features and these are things that we look for in trying to d determine you know is this person is this a friend is this a threat or a friend you know and yeah you know going in this other direction and saying well, what if it's like worn and and kind of you know that implies that it you know. Like, almost as if this mask has been used all these years, and it's it's worn, and, and like, it's survived a lot. Maybe it'll survive these guys as well, kind of thing. And... Let's see... Right, IMDb Trivia notes that a Christmas-themed Scream 6 poster features numerous ghost face masks suggesting there may be more than two ghost face killers in this movie and yeah and let's see um right so i at least one uh, critic or user review said we're told that ghostface is a fan obsessed with the other movies but then it turns out that isn't the case but the, I don't really agree that that's, like, um, I mean, it's true that Richie, Richie's family, like, the, the getting revenge for him is a big part of why they're doing it, but I, I think the, they are also, at, at least one of them is also obsessed with the other movies. And let's see. Um, right, so yeah, a critic, one critic said um, the showdown in the usual abandoned auditorium is perhaps the campiest yet to be unveiled proving that a generally clapped out franchise is capable of some fairly fun death throws. So, yeah, I don't think that this is the death throws, but but yeah, it is that is definitely a fun scene. 
see. I get yeah. I'll I'll uh, one person said the killer reveal confrontation is fairly unsatisfying when you link it with the tension during the first two acts. It almost feels like the killer reveals are thrown in from a different movie. I don't really agree, but you know, to each their own. That is it for this video. So let me know in the comments what is your favorite scary movie. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's Ghostface. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. They suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing Spolo thoughts on a movie and one talking about my Spolo thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus live action Star Wars show, which of these days is The Mandalorian. Recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalogs. Let's catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.